Hello and welcome to our presentation on managing GIS and geospatial data in the cloud. NV5 Geospatial is the largest geospatial company in North America. We operate all along the value chain of, from acquisition of LIDAR and imagery to processing and applications that allow us to view our, that allow us to view our analytics and point clouds and imagery. We are generally acquiring data 363 days a year. As a result, we see roughly two petabytes of raw data come through our doors each year. And that doesn't even include everything created as a part of processing the data. I'm Greg Sims. I'm a product manager on the Insight team. The Insight team is a software development team creating a SaaS platform to support the needs of NV5 Geospatial's clients, as well as our own acquisition and processing teams. I've been on the development team since just a few months before we all went virtual. So about five years. Before that, I was in the smart home IoT space working with big data. Today, I will talk about the challenges of managing GIS and geospatial data and how we at NV5 Geospatial have developed a solution, followed by a demo of how Insight meets those challenges. Speaking of which, 90% of the data in the world in existence was created in just the last two years. It's been estimated that 80% of data is geographic. Much of the data in the world can be georeferenced, which indicates the importance of being able to handle big geospatial data sets. In general, big data can be structured and or unstructured data sets with massive data volumes that cannot be easily stored, analyzed, or managed by traditional hardware, software, or database technologies. The increasing volume and varying formats of collected geospatial data poses additional challenges in storing, visualizing, and verifying the quality of the data. To say nothing of the additional complexity of providing and managing access to all this data quickly. In most organizations, only a few people have the CAD or GIS training necessary to open remote sensing files so that everyone can, so everyone else ends up looking at Excel spreadsheets or at the OneDrive folders instead. Even the expert users must use different applications to view different types of data, which means data is siloed, kept behind software training or limited, number of, limited numbers of ex expensive seats that have access to these more powerful and complicated software solutions. So what can be done to alleviate this headache? In most cases, there are integrations or bolt-on modules that are available, but that assumes, but that, assumes that you have someone who knows how to set up the system, or you have to hire expensive consultants to do it for you, who will always, you'll have to continue to keep around until unless, when something updates and eventually breaks. Surely there must be a better way. At NV5 Geospatial, we have a need to be able to deliver multiple geospatial products to our clients as fast as possible. So we developed Insight a SaaS platform that is designed to support different data types, such as spherical, LIDAR, photos, and accept different data from different sources, such as watersheds, public parcel information, internal maintenance records, and many others. Insight enables the entire organization to quickly and easily provide and manage access to related information to those who need it. No more having to ask your favorite GIS person to do you a favor and write a complicated query for you, or having to ask which SharePoint folder that $500,000 point cloud is stored in. Everything is available through a single portal that can be integrated with your identity provider, you be it Microsoft or Google, for a secure passwordless login. In Insight, you or any of your less GIS savvy coworkers can type to search with whatever piece of information you have, and the system will find any relevant data it can find. Now, let's walk through an example of how Insight can be used to connect data and provide you with information you need. Let's pretend I'm looking for a new location including a wellhead. First, I can log into Insight with my Google Work account. This will not authenticate me without being a member of password. What do I need to find a site? Well, I need to know where all my existing sites are. 
where the production is highest and which landowners will be impacted. To start, they imported about 1,000 wells in Pennsylvania and around 110,000 parcels from our partners at White Star, who were very kind enough to share that data with us. So as we zoom in into the math layers here, we can see all of the data that we've uploaded into Insight. We open up our search app here, we can see that we have about 22,000 oil and gas sites that we found publicly available, the water resources, as well as some lakes, rivers, as well as some parcels that we were provided that were given to us in each of the views. So with all of this data in insight, we can now see how they interact with each other. So I will uh, I then combine these data sets with publicly available LIDAR and ortho imagery, which we'll get into a little bit later. I also have several other data sets with other sectors such as electrical transmission distribution and veg management. But I've created a dedicated user group to create a data room so we can stay focused on the data sets we care about today. Starting at the map, I can see the layers that are available to me right now. As I zoom in, more layers such as the rivers, existing wellheads, and parcels will be exposed. If we zoom in here, we can see our existing wellheads and the parcels are now visible, as well as the rivers and the lakes if we were close enough. Now, I need to search for a new location. I want to narrow down this search area I'm searching for with the help of a spatial search. So, what we'll do is we'll use a spatial search here. We'll draw a rectangle around an area of interest. This has now highlighted all of the wellheads, as well as any water resources, lakes, rivers, and parcels in our searched area. What we can do now is we can search for our production of our wellheads here. So we can limit our, we can create a filter here to search for only our high producing wells. So now we have highlighted on the map only the wells that are highly producing. And we can also turn on an additional imagery layer here to help us find an open spot here. So here's our ortho photos that we found publicly available that we've added into the system. They can help us zoom in here and find a good location for a potential wellhead based on the fact that these wellheads are highlighted with our current filter for being highly producing. So it looks like we have a good spot here. Uh, what we can do now is we can uh, look at just the parcels here that might be impacted. We can do a quick pop over to our parcels and then we can do another spatial search here in just the area that we're looking at in between these two sections here. And what we'll get is the intersection of all of those parcels that are potentially impacted here. So of course we ended up with 27 parcels that are involved in these uh, wellheads here. So now uh, normally we'd have to be jumping around between multiple systems to get this information. But Insight, we can actually just download that information right out into an Excel file and provide that to a uh, our communications team to reach out to those landowners and see if they're willing and able to uh, participate let us drill a wellhead on their property in this location. So next what we'll do is we will uh, for our next step in our, uh, our process here, we're going to go ahead and use the same spatial search to now export the underlying LIDAR that is in this area. So we want to uh, jump back over into our oil and gas section here. Uh, we can look at this area here. We have this area clipped out, and 
that we can jump into our clip and ship here. And we can see that we are already have clipped it down to just that area. So we have our LIDAR that's in this area, as well as our orbit photos. But we don't need those for to do that LIDAR analysis. So we can uncheck the box for our, our orbit photos. And then all we need to do now is name the file that we want to download here. So we can have a new site here, package up that data, and download it directly in the browser. Uh, and of course, depending upon how wide of an area we are looking at, we will get other options to download when the browser is not inappropriate. And this saves us a lot of time for delivery to our clients because they can you we can deliver large amounts of data using clip and ship rather than having to ship a hard drive across the country, waiting five or six days that it takes to get there, plus IT having to receive that, that hard drive figuring out where they can put it onto their servers, we can provide that data directly to our clients. Immediately, as soon as we have loaded it up into our cloud, they can come into Clip and Ship, find the area of interest they want, clip it, and then pull it down for a download and use it as they need to in whatever systems they need to do further analysis on that data. So once Switch gears here, and let's choose a new use case. So let's pretend for a moment, we pop back into search here, that we are uh, a uh, customer service representative, and we are getting a phone call from a gentleman who has a well on his property, and he has concerns about a unit that he went out and has read the tag, and it says it's a Goodwin unit 1H. So let's type that in here into our search bar here for Goodwin Unit 1. Now, really we might have to do some cross-referencing to figure out what, uh, where, this, where the gentleman is located, find his address, pull it into another system, and do a lot of extra cross-referencing to figure to find his wellhead. With Insight here, we can very quickly jump to his uh, well, compared to his sites here, we can see that we've narrowed it down to seven different sites here. So let's go ahead and we'll just click on one of them, and the map will zoom in for us and take us right down to his, looks like his sites that are here. Uh, what we can do is we can actually, uh, when we're at that site, we can see all of the facts, all of the data and attributes that we have on those different wells. So we can see how long it's been there, the data we plugged, uh, we also can look at some additional metadata and relation related data to this pump. So we can actually look at some images of that pump right here in Insight. So where I was able to find um, publicly available inspection data for this site. So we can actually zoom in and open up and look right at the photograph from the inspector when they were last there and see the tag uh, for this particular pump. Or we can see what the state of the pump is here. Uh, just going to do a, a media viewer here and see what are the conditions at this at this pipe at this pump site uh, and save ourselves a truck roll. Pretty cool. Uh, we can also view the document that was associated with that inspection. So we can open up the PDF and see uh, what was going on with that with that pump and see that oh it looks like everything was was in good condition. So there's no question, there's no issues with this. Oh, so very quickly, using Insight, we can use a search function, do a quick search based on any piece of information that we can get and very rapidly find all the related information for that particular pump. We can also take a look at this pump site in 3D from one location. So let's go ahead and let's jump into the 3D viewer. Okay, now that our 3D viewer has loaded in all of our points here, we can zoom out a little bit and we can see all of our 3D point cloud that we have for this area. This is our publicly available 3D point cloud. So we can see all of our various classifications here 
all end up in different colors for us in the map. Uh, within the 3D viewer, we can turn on and off some of these classes so we can see what's ground and what's not here, uh, depending upon how well it's been classified. You can turn off vegetation if we want to see underneath that vegetation in that area. And then close out that 3D viewer. And we've now been able to answer very quickly the question uh, for the landowner there. We are not limited to the oil and gas data types. We can access multiple types of data regardless of industry. So let's switch over to another instance of insight and see how we can explore vegetation management in the context of electoral distribution. So we're going to now switch our user group over from EnergyIS to our VM. And what we've done now is we have seamlessly switched instances between user groups are now in a different data room, if you will, where we have access to a completely different set of data in a completely different area of the world. We can now open up our search table here and we can see the new features that we have access to. So we have access to some distribution poles, some transmission lines, as well as some treetops. Um, we're interested in this case is to pretend that we are a vegetation manager in charge of a crew. And our assignment today is to see what trees we need to trim between a couple of streets over here in the southeast corner of Portland. So if we narrow down that, that search, what we'll do is we'll look and we'll do a quick uh, facial search here to narrow down to between uh, 92nd Street here and 82nd Street. Uh, and to make it a little less confusing here, we'll go ahead and we'll turn off a couple of layers here. So we're just looking at our distribution line. So there's our distribution line between 92nd and 82nd. And we'll go ahead and we'll draw our rectangle here to narrow down our search. All right, and there we go. So we have successfully identified around 337 trees that are in our zone of interest. Uh, what we can see with some metadata about these trees, thanks to some analytics that we've done using LIDAR, uh, we have a couple of different categories that we can use to make a decision about the action that we need to take with these trees. So we have a couple of different factors here. So uh, the one that we're going to pay attention to first is our grown in as flow. What that means is that we can, using LIDAR, measure the location of the wires and locate the distance from those wires out to the canopy of a given tree. We can identify each individual tree and figure out how close that tree's canopy is to the wire. And depending upon that, we can rate it on a zone scale from zone four all the way up to zone one. Um, and we can basically do a quick filter to see how many of those trees are in that zone one that are of highest concern and highlight just those trees so we know what we actually need to go and take care of. Uh, so we can see here if we're down to from a list of 337, we're now down to just a list of 42. So we can really narrow down our focus here and only see we're only focused on the trees that actually need it. What we can do is we can also do a quick uh, filter here, save our filter here, and create a new, uh, save this filter so that we can pull this up later if we need to. Uh, so we can just add a new filter and you'll call it uh, next week's work and save that filter so that we can pull this filter up if we need to again. Uh, so we can see these trees here. You see that we got a 40, around 42 of them. We can, not, we can actually uh, look at these trees in 3D so we can uh, see what all is happening with them. So we can select a tree here and we can jump into our 3D. And the point cloud loads up for us. 
So we can see uh, with this classified LIDAR, we can see uh, all the areas here that are shaded in pink here. We'll go ahead and full screen this for ourselves. And we can see that we've got uh, large areas here of trees that are all in yellow here are where we've got uh, growing. And then where we have potential falling risk, we have all these areas highlighted in this sort of red and pink area. Um, so if we want to see what that looks like here, we can uh, turn off those layers here, just to kind of give ourselves a little bit good review of what's going on. So we can see where the trees are, we can see uh, what areas are classified as a threat. Um, now, a neat thing with LIDAR is that we can actually uh, remove all of those threats and see our equipment up underneath all of that vegetation. If we cruise over here in the LIDAR to a pole, we can still see the pole in the LIDAR data here, even though it's probably pretty much fully surrounded by vegetation at this time. And it's very difficult to pick it out there, but you can just you can just see it. Um, but we can to make it a little bit easier to see, we can go ahead and we can hide uh, the ground and around the, and the surrounding vegetation. That really lets us see where that asset is. Now, in 3D point clouds, we can take advantage of uh, knowing where all these points are, and we can actually do some basic measurements. So we can actually figure out uh, how far apart some of these things are. So if we wanted to, for instance, figure out how uh, far apart some of these uh, wires are, so if we were uh, thinking about these wires as pipes instead of wires, we can wonder like how far apart are, some, are a set of pipes to see if there's a clearance issue between the pipe, uh, between a set of pipes. We could just measure that, take a point here on the point cloud here, and then measure down and see that we've got the vertical clearance of about 12 feet from our uh, the neutral wires down to our uh, communication wires down at the bottom of the pipe, at the bottom of this pole here, uh, and give a pretty good idea of uh, our distance here. But all that is available within the 3D point cloud. So we can provide not only analytics, but also provide some basic measurement tools within the cloud. Next up, let's think about the, one of the, some of the other analytics that we have available to us within Insight. So let's go back to our search results here and look back at our list of trees that we were concerned about. So uh, in addition to worrying about the, uh, the grow-in uh, vegetation, there is also uh, that risk of fall-in, of a tree being sick and falling over and potentially hitting a line or a pipe. Uh, with our analytics that we can provide, we can detect those as well. Um, so what we can do with that is we can use LIDAR to actually calculate the top of a tree, locate the base of that tree, and calculate the falling distance of that tree to see if it intersects with any of our assets. And using that, using that map, we can then categorize uh, all of our trees in, a, in, that, uh, in that manner. So let's take a look and see how many trees we have in that uh, fall-in zone here. It looks like we've got, oh, we lost our, we lost our filter there. Let's just redo our filter real quick here. There we go. All right, and we've got about 28 trees in, uh, in our area of interest. Now, uh, another very cool thing that we can do uh, when we are doing this co-acquisition of data of LIDAR, we can also pick up hyperspectral information. And the hyperspectral data, we can also use that to provide some even gran more granular details about, uh, about the health of vegetation. Um, and so one of the things that we can do that's very, very cool is that we can use that hyperspectral data to identify the species of the tree, or, or in this case, more importantly, we can identify the health of that tree. So we can see that all of these trees are healthy. And but that means that in this case, for this area, 
we don't have to worry about any of these trees uh, at, at this moment to, um, to deal with the permitting process and deal with the city to remove these trees uh, from, uh, from our right of way to prevent damage to our infrastructure. But layering all that information in, in one place makes it so much easier to look up and provide these quick decisions that you can go out there in the field and take some action. So we can uh, very easily hop back to our uh, previous uh, filter where we have our list of, uh, of our zone one growing trees. We're ready to go and get back to work and go into the field. So we can again uh, very easily download our list into Excel or if we wanted a GDB, we could download that as well. Uh, and take that into some other tool and do some uh, further analysis, or we can take that Excel spreadsheet and take that into, onto a laptop, identify these trees out in the field, and show them up as, as needed. And all this is accessible within an application that I can search and quickly explore and easily find what I need and download it. To wrap up, here are six takeaways we learned about managing geospatial data in the cloud. One, by hosting data in the cloud, you can eliminate complicated local IT infrastructure, control access by setting up secure passwordless authentication, and create user groups or data rooms to limit data users can access. Organize your data using geospatial information so your data on the map, so your data is on the map rather than having to navigate through long lists of files. Ensure your tools can handle large volumes of data so you don't have long load times for users. Link your data together so it can be accessed through a single portal. And lastly, make sure the entire organization can easily search and connect data sets. For our Q&A, I've asked Mike Fuller, our Director of Energy Solutions, to join me and answer any questions you have about MV5 Geospatial. Uh, collection and or processing services. And I'm of course happy to do my best to answer any questions you have uh, of anything you saw in the presentation. And of course, uh, thank you for attending Energy IS and I look forward to your questions. <laughs>